Welcome to the first official episode of In Conversation With, your one-stop podcast for all your educational entertainment, where we explore the stories and insights of remarkable individuals shaping our world. Today, we're in conversation with a someone who's our personal inspiration and the pride of our school, our very own principal, Dr. Ambika Gulati. Dr. Gulati has recently completed her PhD in Education and Leadership from NYU University, a very prestigious university. In this episode, we'll dive into her journey, discuss her latest work, and explore her insights on education and balancing work and personal life. We're also very thrilled to know how it was for her to be a student yet again. So sit back and enjoy. You sing Dr. Ambika Gulati. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. We're really happy to have you here, and we're super excited to ask you questions that everyone wants the answers to. Sure. Starting off. Okay, ma'am, your first question. How did it feel to be a student yet again when you were pursuing your EDD? Um, interesting. So this is not the first time that I've been working and doing a degree. Um, I've done two other degrees while working. One was my bachelor's in education, then I did my master's in education, and now I did the educational doctorate, which is the EDD. And every time I have uh, studied and worked, it has been, especially all these was in school education when I was teaching, uh, it's been a very humbling experience. It also takes me back to being grounded. Mm -hmm. There are readings which are challenging and you don't understand and you empathize with your own students <laughs> to see how difficult it must be ah, for them. Yeah. There are deadlines when assignments have to be given <laughs> and after that you know to submit it comes late and your marks get deducted. <laughs> so one has been through that whole gamut of experiences which all of you face and I think by doing degrees or by doing courses which are very student oriented it keeps us as educators grounded to your reality um, and keeps us humble that we have to think of you and what you go through as students too. <laughs> yeah. I think we all can relate to that <laughs> very well. Yeah. I think we should expect lesser portions <laughs> for this exam. No, no, I don't know. We will be more mindful about how we approach things with you. <laughs> all right, I'm moving on to your next question. Uh, like how you just said, it humbled you, your doctorate program. So what were your key learnings that you took away from your course? Several. Um, I think it's been a huge mindset change for me. I have evolved uh, in my thinking. Uh, it is a research-based program. Uh, you write a dissertation. You engage with a topic for over two years. And uh, that itself is, a, again, a, a challenge and yet excitement uh, to write, to read, to understand. Uh, there are many things I've learned. So I've learned things on leadership, on change management, organizational uh, leadership. So the, forget the content. Content is one thing that you learn, but just the whole process and the evolution of research uh, for me has been very, very exciting. Great. Okay, so ma'am, our previous question was obviously about the key learning. So our, our follow-up question is related to that. Is there anything you learned that you could contribute to the betterment of TMS? Lots, because the EDD is and is for leader, it's leadership and innovation. Yeah. So um, the way the program itself is structured is that as a, as a school leader or any organizational leader, because we were a cohort of about 25 people in this group, and uh, we came from K, the space of K-12, higher ed, healthcare, oil and gas, NGOs, from across the world, right, from Korea, to San Francisco in the United States. So we had people from you know all different countries. And uh, so it was a very interesting, the class used to be very interesting uh, because you got perspective of the same concept, leadership for example, how is it panning out in different organizations uh, around the world. And to come to your question, and you know, I think I'm relating it even to your previous question about key learnings. You realize, at least for me, I realized that what we see in the K-12 space is very akin to what we see in the healthcare space too. So we could, I could draw on learning from the healthcare space and vice versa when we used to have dialogues and discussions about, uh, you know, um, processes and organizations. 
What we are doing to TMS specifically, um, the course is rooted in change management. So you have to write um, a problem of practice that you are seeing in your organization, which is your practice, and how would you like to address that to make an improvement in that uh, organization. So that is what I looked at and I was wanting to, so it's interesting because I want, I was when I entered the course, it was like, okay, how do you build critical thinking skills in middle school students in a K-12 yeah. school mm -hmm. in the UAE? So I mean, I, I thought I had my research question very, very set and good to go. But over time, that whole research question changed, but the context remained the same, that it was a K-12 Indian curriculum school in the UAE. And it was now about a larger perspective of building thinking skills in the school students. But because I can't directly engage with students, so how do I mediate that change? I would need to mediate that change with teachers. So the focus then shifted to how do you empower and build capacity for faculty to build the thinking skills in students. So that whole process of change and what we did was we created the, um, what is called professional learning community. So your teachers stay back on Thursdays once a month and once a month is dedicated time where we you know, have a cross section of faculty come together. We had a framework called cultures of thinking and every uh, month we deconstructed one aspect of that. So people shared what they're doing with respect to that particular culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a lot of learning, sharing of ideas, collaboration. So that's how it's in, impacted Millennium. And I think you've seen that in, ter in terms of impact because you can see asset scores have gone up. Mm -hmm. Not only because of this, there are many other things we do. But you know, we and we just generally find uh, a culture of collegiality has improved within the staff members. There's a lot more discussion across phases rather than just being phase specific or subject specific. I find faculty is now interacting. So I could be a science teacher in primary, but I'm reaching out to maybe the head of section in senior mm -hmm. because she's part of my group mm -hmm. and I feel comfortable enough to reach out to her. So there's been a lot of that interchange of ideas at the school. Absolutely, ma'am. In fact, I think the fact that you mentioned the diversity and the people that they come from so many different countries, yeah. I feel like that could really add up to, you know, more key learnings because I mean learning with other people and interacting with them also increases and adds a really good Absolutely. experience. Absolutely and I think uh, I've drawn on the people of my cohort so I, we have had those people as guest speakers at school already mm -hmm. you know so we got somebody if I don't know if you recollect we had the senior vice president of enrollments and marketing from NYU address the uh, students yeah. uh, you know yeah. a few months ago and I think it was my, in my first year we had this lady who works at uh, Walt Disney uh, oh. and she is the sustainability head there. So she came and addressed uh, you know, your senior batches on how Walt Disney is looking at sustainability and what they do. So I think I've drawn on my cohort members also mm -hmm. to you know, speak to your students mm -hmm. so that you can get an idea of what is happening in other sectors around the world. Absolutely, that's amazing to hear, and we genuinely hope that you know more people and inspiring people come here and you know Maybe inspire us. Inspire and talk to us on our podcast as well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll organize for that. It should be like um, like we had the guest Dr. Pillai visit yeah. us, yeah. and we had to interview him. And to us students, it was the most inspirational moment of our lives because you don't get to meet a man like that, a man of his greatness every day. Yeah. So having people like that visit and talk to us one-on-one -on -one and tell us that they've been through what we're going through really gives us that push, that drive to finish what we're here to do. Absolutely. So. Yeah. yeah. All right, moving on with the next question, which is, do the SLT, which is the student leadership team and student leaders at TMS resonate with your course learnings in leadership? Yes, uh, so SLT I'll take as the senior leadership senior team leadership. of the school, which is the faculty. You know, mm -hmm. the, Correct. Absolutely. Um, very, very visible in what I have learned theoretically and what we see on the ground here. Mm -hmm. So um, the leaders of the school definitely um, couple trans transactional leadership, which is like, you know, uh, for example, getting timetables done, ensuring that the school is running efficiently, managing that aspect, which no school can do without. 
they couple that with being transformational leaders. Mm -hmm. So if you yourself look back, how many years have you been in the school? 81. Okay, so sure. let's say last four or five years if you've been in school, or yes. do you see a change in the school that has happened absolutely. in terms yeah, of whether it's your pedagogical practice, whether it is, you know, your course curricular activities, mm -hmm. the, the expanse that is being offered, whether it is your student leadership itself, you know, mm -hmm. how exactly. it's expanded. So if you're seeing those changes, it means that the school's leadership team is being transformational. That they're bringing that change in the school for the betterment of the young people who are under our care. Mm -hmm. So um, I think those are very significant theories that are applicable to school leaders. There's also what is called distributed leadership. So it's not that I'm single-handedly running the school. We have an SLT. It's like what your students are doing. So earlier it was a head boy and a head girl and just the school and the captain. But now it's distributed across so many councils. Mm -hmm. Right? So there is a vast expanse in your leadership team. That is another theory of leadership, team leadership. So these are all concepts that you learn in, in theory, but you can see them on the ground in school. In mm -hmm. fact, I would like to share an experience which actually happened with me yesterday within this week. So in my class, we have this new student and he came from IHS, I believe. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we were talking about the senior students who were, you know, sending us into class during break times. And he was like, oh, is that the head boy, is that the head girl? Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, that's not really how we work here because that used to be the case a few years ago, but now we have changed. And it's more like captains, presidents, and then there are student leaders and secretaries. It's so vast and almost like more than half the grade hold a position. He's like, oh, but uh, in most schools, it's just head boy, head girl, and maybe a few prefects, but that's it, uh, because, you know, you have to be exceptionally good. And I was like, yes, maybe at TMS, students are exceptionally good. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was something I enjoyed talking to him about. Also, adding on to what Pari just said, um, I think that's what makes TMS such a special school, is that it's always ready to change, and it's always open to change. It's never, again, obviously the first time that we pitch an idea, there are a lot of questions, a lot of hurdles that come up, but TMS has never said, no, we are not going to change this. Like after so many years of having head boys, head girls, and that format, when the question was raised, we changed, and that's benefited everyone in the school right from KG to grade 12. And I think that is what I think we pride ourselves in nurturing in you young people, that mm -hmm. raise the questions. Now. Maybe we cannot implement everything that you want done. But unless you don't raise those critical questions, which you see in your uh, perspective are incorrect or need to be addressed, mm -hmm. you know, you need to know those. Then we can take an informed decision through debate, through dialogue. Uh, I mean, in 2018, when we wanted to make the school co ed, mm -hmm. you know, it was a journey. It took us a whole year to actually work with, and it was again a student led initiative. Uh, mm -hmm. where they, you know, wanted and they got this done. But, um, yeah, so we, it, it change is not <coughs> easy, but change can be, has to be managed. And uh, I think we, we love it when you guys come up with <coughs> your own, uh, ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, ma'am, now for a bit more personal question. Sure. Um, how would you say your family supported you during your <laughs> course of your education? Yeah. Oh, they supported me. That's not a difficult question at all. They supported me by staying out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you ask my husband, he will tell you how his golf has improved tremendously <laughs> because uh, he would go off at about 5.36 in the evening and come back only at about 8 or 10. And that gave me the time to finish school. So, I had a quite a crazy routine. So, during the week, actually, I would not do much work on my coursework. But Friday, Saturday, and Sunday was actually fully dedicated to yeah. course, and so which meant that schoolwork could not be compromised. Com compromise, so I had to finish everything every day, yeah, course, yeah. and uh, couldn't linger on to the weekend. Mm -hmm. So you know you can't say okay I can do this over the weekend mm -hmm. because over the weekend I needed to do readings and writing and really be uh, with it. So yeah, I think they the time spent with the family got compromised. That's the only. Would you say that this course? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Would you say, ma'am, this course helped you, or like, in any way, in your time management skills? Oh yes, tremendously. 
tremendously. But you stretch also and you realize, and this is not just this course. I mean, like I said, I did my B.Ed, M.Ed also when I was working. Um, and when I did my M.Ed, for example, I had class four days a week uh, and I had to go to university. Uh, so that was all right. But way back from university to I used to stay in Gurgaon, would take an hour and a half, two hours back. Oh. And uh, you realize how much you can stretch if you want to. Uh, so, for example, you cut off your afternoon sleep, you know, and then you just save so much time. And you've got so much time, then suddenly to do something else, you know. It can be hard for some people, though, because personally, I love my afternoon So did I. Let me tell you, Pari, yeah. I was, I'm very fond of an afternoon nap. Yeah. But uh, when you have to stretch to do something that excites you, yeah, it yeah. just goes. You have to be passionate about what you do. To set your priorities. Yeah. I think we all have a very important question. Do you take afternoon naps? <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a Saturday and a Sunday when I'm not working at school? Yes, definitely. Okay, so Saturday and Sunday. On the yeah. weekends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good to know, good to know. <laughs> your question is next. It's mine? Maybe. Oh, That's no, I drum. Sorry. That's mine. Sorry. Wait, take two seconds and then. Yeah. Uh, so ma'am, our next question is, what prompted you to take this course after being part of TMS for more than seven years? So the course has nothing to do with TMS. <laughs> uh, it's been my dream to do a doctoral program. This was my fourth attempt to do it. Oh. So the first opportunity I got was when I graduated from Cambridge. They made me an offer to come back and do a, a, a PhD in economics. And at that time, I had gone back to India and I didn't want to go back to England. Uh, I think the weather of England just uh, traumatized me every time I thought about the rain and you know carrying my grocery bags and I said no I can't do it so I declined the offer that they made. Then the second time when I did my masters in education um, I had an automatic entry because of my grades to do the MPhil PhD in, the, in Delhi University and my children said uh, ma don't study anymore. You know, but they were really tiny. So I, because I told you there was such a commuting time to yeah, and for yeah. college. So I said, all right, when time is next. Then I came here and uh, then I was determined that I had to get a doctoral program. And someone told me about the EDD and not a PhD, which is, you know, more rigorous in terms of academically more rigorous and takes longer time. EDD is more in about three years you can finish and it's more structured. Um, and I got admission. And uh, because I just got my job at Millennium, mm -hmm. I decided to say no to that again because I wanted to first concentrate and yeah. establish, you know, my own feet in Millennium before I mm -hmm. spread myself too thin. Mm -hmm. So this was actually my fourth endeavor okay. to, to do the doctoral program. Okay. So ma'am, the next question is, what advice would you give to young people aiming to pursue a PhD or EED or an MPhil um, to, in continuation after masters or do you recommend to take a gap of few years, maybe gain some work experience like how you have done? It depends. Uh, it really depends. So for example, the program that I did is for leaders and you have to have a certain, uh, you know, um, leadership experience to be able to engage with this program. Now that may not be true of a requirement of other programs. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel that when you have a certain amount of work experience, it does add value to the next degree that you are okay. undertaking. And especially a research program, I feel that you know, working brings a different lens and a different perspective to how you view even readings, mm. which are which are abstract. But so I used to find that even abstract concepts of leadership, I would try and see where am I seeing them in school or am I not seeing them in school? Mm. You know, so it just made it much easier to relate to what you're reading and what you're writing. Um, so it's difficult to answer. Yeah. You'll have to look at your own priorities. Um, but I personally always feel that a little bit of work experience after your bachelor's or after your master's is important to take the next trajectory. Then, you're, then also you know you're taking an informed decision that you are really excited about doing this degree. It's not just yeah. rolling from one into the other. Like many of us, I mean, when we were growing up, the, the whole thing was that you have to finish education and then get to work. So all of us did schooling, bachelor's, master's, 
PhD or you know a doctoral degree those who wanted to after a master's went into a job market but that's not the case for youth people mm. i love the way how most of you are now saying okay we'll do school maybe we'll take a gap year and then do university we'll do our undergrad after that everyone wants to work yeah. i think that entire trend of not doing a masters has come up in a very big way which i'm seeing with all of you which is good because it allows you then to take informed choices as to what that master should be hmm. rather than just doing it because it's a tick in the box exactly what i've also noticed is that you know what some students think uh, is that let's just complete all our education in one go and then we can work on job and family and you know other situations so would you say that is that something you would recommend um that let's finish our education one go or let's take gaps because um again later on you know depending on the situation on your family maybe you'll not able to complete your further education so it co- could also you know depending on the situation again it could i think i've already answered that question yeah, you yeah. Have. but uh, it all depends on you okay um and so i think i was a little bit of a rebel even in you know if you look at it now because after my graduation i decided to take a gap year and it was unheard of people would do bachelors and then go into the workspace or then they would immediately roll into a masters and i consciously chose to take a gap year and go into the school which i had graduated from to you know uh, teach there for a year and uh, my family thought that was the end of my educational career <laughs> because that you know once you start working you won't get get, get no and you won't go back into it yeah, yeah. right yeah i think that was the thought process of my parents generation i don't think your parents uh, or have that kind of a thought process because the world has evolved the opportunities have evolved and i think the need of the hour is to constantly learn uh you can never say you've learned enough or you have had enough education because there's always something you know we all need to learn how to use ai you all need to know what is how do you write that prompt to get the right answer from the ai it's it's a learning yeah. now you can do a formal course you can sit with a friend and do it but you have to learn yeah. so i think the notion of finishing education doesn't exist anymore mm-hmm. as the world is growing and developing so rapidly so we all have to keep learning mm-hmm. so it's a question of how you want to learn Oh, I definitely agree because if you would have asked me let's say 6 years ago what I would say 6 year old me I'll do my school bachelor's masters then forget about school as a whole and just work 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 however I think because of how my seniors have started to think how the teachers have ta- started to think how my parents have started to think now I have so many options. I can do whatever. I, I can choose to not do a masters at all and do something yeah. completely different. And that's opened up so many job opportunities for all the students at TMS. And that's really beneficial. Okay, moving on to the next question. I mean, you are the most competent person we know. <laughs> the biggest inspiration to every kid in TMS, right from the KG1 kid to a senior in grade 12 i'm humbled i'm humbled i don't think so <laughs> what were the main challenges that you faced during your doctorate oh on a lighter note i can tell you very much waking up at 3 in the morning <laughs> uh, i used to have class from 3:30 to 5 was it because of the time difference yeah. Yeah. Oh. because it was new york time mm-hmm. um, at 7 or 7:30 their time and and uh, then i used to finish class at 5 and quickly get ready to come to school so my days used to start at 3:30 twice a week at least if not more and so that was a challenge i have to say uh, got very tiring um, but other than that uh, time management and like i said earlier yes my family was out of my hair <laughs> but uh, you know to keep those connections going and you have to carve out time from somewhere to catch up and uh, So those were some of the challenges. Ma'am, would you say it was worth it? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. What time did you sleep at night to wake up at 3? Oh, 11 o'clock. Not oh, really. Four sleep. hours of sleep. Oh. I I sleep at 10 just to wake up at 6. <laughs> no, but yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, when I was 12th grade as we... Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So yeah. that's why I started the conversation exactly. by saying it was a humbling experience. Yeah. Because you understand what your own students are going through. Because see, as faculty, we are experts. When I teach economics, I'm a so-called expert in mm -hmm. economics. I know the concepts already. So I will feel that you should be able to get it like that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. there are readings and there's, you know, to digest those concepts, it takes time. And sometimes we might forget it. That's what, by putting yourself through a course where you've got difficult things to do, you realize what the, kid, mm -hmm. the students are going through. <laughs> So, ma'am, are we planning a course for all teachers at TMS? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll be surprised how much, how many courses t teachers at TMS do. Okay. Yeah. So every every Thursday, so we like right now also where your faculty is there uh, in department meetings. So they're exchanging ideas, they're looking at practices, they're seeing what's working, what's not working for all of you. So there's a lot of dialogue and discussion, and that cannot happen unless they don't read and they don't engage with the professional. Okay, ma'am, and that was our last question for today's podcast. As we conclude, we are grateful for the opportunity to hear from Dr. Ambika Gulati, <laughs> Thank you. whose recent academic achievements further demonstrate her commitment to educational leadership. The insights she shared in this interview will no doubt leave a lasting impact on our school community and beyond. Her vision for the future of the Millennium School Dubai promises an exciting and innovative direction for years to come. Thank you, ma'am, for coming with us. Thank you. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to speak to all of you. Uh, and I thought the questions would be something that I was nervous, actually, <laughs> because I didn't know what you guys were going to ask me. But thank you. It's been a very engaging conversation. Thank, thank you. you so much, ma'am. Make sure to catch us on YouTube, Spotify, and Instagram. We can't wait to see you guys next time with an exciting guest and an exciting podcast. Thank you. In conversation team, out.